My Sterling Single Part 44, reassembling the tender frames and fitting new springs to see if the frames are the same height as the engine. The first part of the job is to remove the chocolate brown paint from the edges of the horn blocks. I didn't use much masking tape when I painted these frames especially in the area of the horn blocks because it's really easy to scrape the paint off once it's dried. Here are two sets of axle boxes. I'm about to fit the first set into the frames. Luckily, they're all numbered. Each of the axle boxes has a hole where the spring fits. This hole is a quarter of an inch in diameter and doesn't go all the way through, but at the bottom of the hole there's a smaller hole to allow oil to get to the axle. I put a drop of oil down each of the holes, and in this clip I'm also applying some oil to the side of the axle boxes. With miniature steam locomotives, and even the full size, it's very important that the axle boxes are allowed to slide up and down very freely. As I'm editing this video, I notice that I left some paint on the inside of one of the pairs of horns. So before fitting this particular axle set, I cleaned the paint off the horn blocks. The wheel sets have a washer at each end. And here I'm making sure that the washers are in position before sliding the axle boxes into place. In this clip you can still see some paint on the inside of the horn blocks, but it's not a problem, the axles slide up and down very freely. After fitting the first wheel set in place, I thought it would be a good idea to reconnect the brake gear. You will notice that I haven't painted all the brake gear because I don't want this thing to look brand new, because it isn't. The pin that goes through the brake gear is held in position by a split pin, and in order to refit the split pin into the hole, the ends have to be really tightly pressed together. Here's a top tip showing the way that I open a split pin once it's in position, just by using a pair of side cutters, and once I get it partially open, I then use a screwdriver blade to open it some more. There's no possible way this pin can fall out of the hole. Now the primary brake hanger is connected to the brake operating arm. I'm now going to move on to fitting the centre wheels. And once again I can see that some of the paint hasn't been removed, but I'm going to leave it. It will be removed by the axle box sliding up and down in the fullness of time. And as always I assemble the parts with a generous application of lubricating oil. Before fitting the axle boxes in place, I'm removing the paint from the edges. I'm using a piece of brass for this that once held the chimney inside the smoke box. I didn't refit this part inside the smoke box because it doesn't actually do anything other than falls off the bolts after a while. But it's good for scraping the paint off the edges of the horn blocks. Rather than do this job one axle at a time, I cleaned off the rest of the paint from the other horn box. While on the subject of paint, you may notice that I haven't painted these axle boxes like they were originally. They were painted black, and I'm fairly sure that on the full-size tender for a Sterling Single, they are also painted black. I don't intend to do any lining on this engine because it's something that I really am not good at. I'm even toying with the idea of leaving some of the other parts unpainted so it looks like a really classy Victorian toy. I don't know yet. I'll give that some thought. In the meantime, here I'm fitting the keeper plates. The function of these keeper plates is obvious. They are to stop the axle boxes falling out of the slot if the tender is lifted off the track. And each of the axle boxes has a corresponding keeper plate. Here's a shot of the tender frames with all of the wheels in place and I'm applying some oil to the top of each axle box. Today is Thursday the 21st of April and it's spring, and to celebrate that, here are some springs. The spring on its own, on the right hand side of this image, is one of the original axle box springs, and it's quite weak. On the left hand side of the image are five of the six springs that are bought from Blackgate's engineering. The holes in the top of the axle boxes are quarter of an inch in diameter, and the springs are a bit smaller than this because you don't want them to bind inside the axle box. This is a very important clip. There's some good information in this clip if you look carefully. Can you see how the edges of the axle box are radiused? This is to allow the axle box to tilt, not just go up and down in a slot. When I make locomotive axle boxes, 
I normally will only make one flange which is on the inside, but the design of this tender shows the horn blocks the other way round, so you have to put flanges on both sides of the axle box. And you also need to file the radius, like you can see here, on the flange at the other side of the axle box. A short while ago, a customer brought an engine to me because he needed me to repair it. It was a brand new engine, he'd built it himself and it would not run. During the early part of the conversation with this customer, he said that he trained as a toolmaker and he found some of my engineering methods a bit strange. It's OK, my back's broad enough and I can take the insults. The only thing I can say is my steam engines and locomotives work very well and his wouldn't work at all. For one thing, none of the axle boxes were radiused as shown here. I actually turned down this job because of the amount of work required just to rebuild the engine completely from the ground up. On the full-size engine, it used leaf springs. These are actually castings, quite good castings. What I would expect from Blackgate's engineering. There is a quarter of an inch diameter hole drilled in the bottom of the dummy spring. And that's how the compression spring is made to work in this application. I've come across a bit of a problem. The longest springs of this size that Blackgate's engineering do are one inch. Looking back at the images of these springs, the bottom parts need to be ground flat. But if I do grind the end of these springs flat, then they'll sit nicely in the axle boxes, but they'll be too short. For the moment, I'm going to assemble them the way they are, and as you can see, it's quite difficult to get the dummy spring to sit perfectly in the middle. In this case, the spring is leaning heavily to the left, following the angle of the ends of the springs. However, there is a workaround on this, and I'll show this in a future episode. Without squaring off the end of the springs, I went ahead with the job to see how bad it was. The job itself wasn't too bad, just very fiddly. And four out of the six suspension units were more or less in the middle. But I'm not happy with the job and I'll show you the work around in due course. In this clip I'm completing the assembly by fitting the links that pull the brakes onto the wheels. With everything assembled, I sat the tender frame behind the locomotive and coupled it up using the drawbar. I think that this tender is going to be a little bit close to the locomotive. It's going to look good as a display piece, but running round a track would be a problem. And also, on Sterling singles, the front splashes or mud guards over the front bogey have a similar problem. Even though I really do like a Sterling single as a design, it's iconic. But in the model sizes, you have to take one or two liberties to make it successfully run. The front splashes, for instance, need to be slightly further out so that the bogey doesn't foul the inside of the splasher when you go around a corner. Apart from the drawbar between the engine and the tender being far too short, the other obvious problem is the tender frames are sitting too low relative to the frames of the engine, and bear in mind the top of the tender hasn't been fitted and it's not full of water. I should be able to sort this out by modifying the suspension. You may be surprised by what I will have to do to make this happen, but I'm not going to do it just yet. This will be in a future episode. For now, I'd just like to say stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainstream Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.